Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Ur Inger. I'm a professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Amsterdam uh, and a researcher at the Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam. My research focuses on uh, mass violence against civilians. Uh, since 2011, I have focused mostly on uh, state violence uh, in Syria, on which I've written uh, a book uh, called Syrian Gulag, which is on the prison system in Syria. Uh, we've also recently uh, published a research uh, piece on the massacre in Tadamon. Uh, this is a neighborhood in Damascus, uh, and this is what my research is about. And will you share, please, with the panel some of your findings in relation to perhaps to all this, the conditions of, of prisoners in Syria since 2011, but perhaps uh, whatever the scope of your research is, and also the response. Uh, if it was part of your study of the state, I uh, the different institutions of the state to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I've uh, uh, prepared a short presentation that I will uh, present now. Um, we have recently written uh, a book uh, with the title Syrian Gulag. Uh, in this book, uh, which just came out last week, uh, first in Dutch, uh, we argue that the, uh, the Assad regime uh, or the Syrian government uh, is running a, a gulag, which is a uh, elaborate prison system, uh, which has four dimensions, um, and which uh, is uh, designed to repress uh, Syrian society in uh, unprecedented ways. And these four dimensions uh, are the four chapters in this book, the intelligence branches, first of all, second, the military prisons, third, uh, the civil prisons, and fourth, the secret prisons. Now, in this book, we asked uh, the two questions. Uh, one is, first of all, how and why did the Assad regime build its power through its prison system since 1970, since, the, uh, since Hafez Assad came to power? And second, how does the specter of the prison system affect Syrian society? What are its consequences for this country? And, um, and I would like to present briefly the uh, uh, overview of this uh, system, this Gulag system, which has four dimensions. And I want to start with the intelligence branches. So the, uh, the apparatus, the regime uh, has um, a wide variety of violent organizations. Uh, there are four color codes here in red, the army and the police. In green, the intelligence branches, so the secret service. In Arabic, this is called Muhabarat. Uh, then third, the special forces or elite troops. And fourth, finally, the paramilitaries in Syrian Arabic called Shabbiha. And this system um, is uh, very elaborate. And the first dimension uh, of this uh, prison system is the Muhabarat, the four major intelligence branches, the military intelligence, the air force intelligence, the political security, and the state security. And let me start with the uh, military intelligence. This is the most powerful uh, intelligence branch uh, of all four. Uh, it is responsible for a large number of files and dossiers. Uh, it has branches, as you can see, in many uh, Syrian uh, uh, cities. Two very notorious branches are uh, 215, and the other one, 227 in Damascus. Uh, the research that we did last week on the massacre in Tadamon was by branch 227. Uh, but that's only one of these uh, branches. Uh, the second leg of the intelligence is the Air Force intelligence. Uh, the Air Force intelligence uh, is uh, a secret service that was established within the Air Force first, because Hafez Assad, he was a pilot. And when he, um, when he built his, uh, his empire in the state, he uh, developed his own intelligence agency inside the Air Force. It is exceptionally powerful. It is exceptionally brutal to the extent that it, its power matches that of the military intelligence. Um, the military uh, prison, uh, of the military airport in Damascus uh, has its headquarters. Uh, it is the uh, location where the infamous Caesar photos 
uh, were leaked from. But third, we have the political security. The political security is specialized in any and all forms of political activism. It has the same authority to arrest people, uh, to torture people. Every single one of these branches, they have uh, staff, they have people working for them, which means uh, there are investigators, there are professional torturers, uh, and there are underground, uh, one, two, three, four floors underground, there are uh, prison cells and torture chambers. All the other uh, intelligence agencies also have these. And the final one is the state security, which is uh, responsible um, uh, for an, a number of dossiers relating to state, on spying on uh, state employees, for example, in some areas it is responsible for border security. It is the oldest, but also in a way the most civil and the weakest of the four intelligence agencies. Now we might ask the question, why does a state have four different intelligence agencies? And that's for a number of reasons, for stability, for the regime, uh, to spy on each other, uh, to uh, have a labor division, a division of labor in the country of uh, what to monitor and what to repress. And most importantly, all of them, they operate with complete and utter impunity. Uh, no agent of the intelligence, any of these intelligence agencies, is subject to any form of rule of law, not really. And uh, second, they operate very systematically, which means they um, um, th there is a, a logic and there is a routine to their work. So today, Thousands of men who work for these agencies, they woke up, they went to work, they arrested people, they tortured people, and in the evening they went back home to their families. And tomorrow they will do the same thing. So this is an exceptionally systematic um, uh, uh, machine that has worked since 1970 and is still in power. To give an example of what this means for normal Syrians, here is an, uh, an example, a real example of somebody that we interviewed for our book on prisons, which is what we call double whammy. So a young man is arrested in 2011 for posting on Facebook against the regime. Plain clothes Muhabarat officers show up on his doorstep at midnight. Come with us to the branch, just for a quick coffee, five minutes. He suffers three months of torture, hanging from the ceiling. He is whipped until he soils himself. He develops scurvy and a hernia in his spinal disc. After release, he goes back home, and he can't sleep at night anymore. A few months later, someone knocks on his door again. Two grim men come with us to the branch. But sir, you already arrested me. I just came out of prison. Not by us. That was political security. We are the Air Force Intelligence. So it gives a sense of how uh, elaborate the tentacles of the Muhabarat have wrapped uh, around Syrian society. Now, um, that was only the first leg of the Syrian Gulag. The second leg are the military prisons, the three most infamous ones historically, Meza, uh, then uh, Palmyra or Tadmur prison, and Sednaya, which is still uh, functioning. These are not really prisons, but they are camps. They are uh, uh, mass incarceration uh, camps in which people are kept sometimes for an indefinite period, in which conditions are absolutely atrocious, in which torture, uh, in this regard for human life, mass executions in Sednaya since 2011 are a daily affair. This is where you basically go after you are arrested by one of these branches. You don't stay in the branch forever, you're generally transferred to one of these, so mostly Sednaya. The third leg of the Gulag are the civil prisons. I mean, Syria is a country that also has a, has normal crime, so to speak, so non-political uh, leg of the uh, of, of the uh, the legal system, uh, which means that if you commit a murder, for example, or theft or fraud, you go to one of these civil prisons. They also exist. They are the least violent in general. For many detainees, they are considered almost like a release. If you are sent by the branches here, or you're one, you go from Sednaya to prison like Adra, for example, in Damascus, then you are basically uh, almost free. And the fourth and final dimension of the prison system are the secret prisons, 
The secret prisons are established by any and all of militias, pro-Assad militias who decide to arrest people by themselves, who have impunity to arrest people, uh, take them to an apartment or a farm or anywhere really, where they can keep people, where they can torture them, where they can execute people with complete impunity. So uh, Deir Shmel, for example, is only one example of these, um, of these secret prisons in which countless men uh, have been, men and women have uh, disappeared. Um, there, there are, because they are, these are secret informal prisons, there is no record of uh, these uh, c civilians who are kept here. And, and this also means if someone from the intelligence agencies wants to take out someone from these prisons, it will be difficult because there is no registration. Um, now, the, the man that you see behind behind Bashar al-Assad in this photo, actually exceptionally important man by the name of Ali Memluk. He is one of the really overlords of the Mukhabarat, of the intelligence agencies. He has uh, worked side by side with Hafiz Assad since 1970. Uh, and in the media, for example, there's too much attention either on the very top, either on President Assad himself, or on the ordinary criminals on the ground. But what is really important actually are the bosses of the intelligence agencies, such as Ali Memluk, who has been, this is a short CV, um, is uh, an exceptionally important man who has managed the intelligence system uh, from especially the 1990s on, and since 2011 was very influential in the repression of the uprising, of the demonstrations. There are a number of leaked orders in which he uh, he basically uh, provides impunity and fiat to the intelligence agencies to uh, arrest uh, and disappear uh, um, uh, demonstrators. So he's a prime responsible, actually, for this system. Um, to gradually wrap up, why does this happen? Why is the regime so violent and uh, why does it uh, imprison and torture people on such a scale? Well, there are th uh, three major reasons. One is that of permissible and impermissible politics. So on the left, you see a box in which there are a number of political parties you can be a member of. The Ba'ath Party, the Syrian Social National Party, the Arab Socialist Union, and all of these are permissible politics. There's no problem if you join those parties, and some of them are represented in whatever passes for a parliament in Syria. On the right side, you have a box in which there is politics that's impermissible. So M MB, the Muslim Brotherhood, communists, liberals, but also the 2011 revolution uh, are in this impermissible, illegal politics. The moment that you step into this box, uh, you will be arrested and detained and tortured. The second reason uh, has to do with uh, the, the way that the regime perceives its own country. Those areas this is a map of Damascus. Those areas that demonstrated a lot are red neighborhoods. The regime looks at these neighborhoods with suspicion and with hatred and con um, conceives these neighborhoods as disloyal. In fact, the entire geography is seen as disloyal. And you can see here on the left bottom, there's a really large neighborhood called Dareya. And the regime basically has, paint, has painted with a very broad brush this neighborhood as all of them being disloyal. So even if you are loyal from Dareya, it doesn't matter, uh, you are immediately suspect. Uh, and of course, uh, it, is, um, it speaks to itself that these neighborhoods were, especially the red neighborhoods, have been almost entirely leveled. There's nothing left of a neighborhood like Dareya or Kabun uh, or, for example, Jobar or Arbin, Harasta, Duma, these areas have been completely destroyed because the regime bombed them. In the south, uh, in, you know, in the bottom of the map, you can see Tadamun, this uh, triangular neighborhood that we looked at last week. The third and final explanation has to do with professions. The regime targets certain professions more than others, so it's disproportionately uh, sus suspicious and disproportionately hostile to a number of category of professions. For example, conscientious objectors, those who refuse to go into the army, automatically suspect. 
have to be arrested, have to be tortured, have to be executed. Uh, doctors are very suspicious because they offer help and support to anybody who is wounded, and that includes people who are in the opposition. So if you help somebody who was wounded, who was in the opposition, then you yourself are seen as complicit by the regime. Many hundreds, if not thousands, of doctors have been arrested and tortured. Many of them disappeared simply for helping uh, wounded people. Um, we have lawyers. Lawyers are also seen as automatically suspect because they generally try to upkeep a semblance of the rule of law. So they go to court, they try to defend detainees, they try to uh, follow up on cases, uh, and they try to hold the regime to its own flimsy um, uh, kind of reputation of the rule of law. And finally, one of the most dangerous professions in the eyes of the regime are journalists, because journalists uh, are truth seekers. Uh, journalists, they expose the crimes of the regime, and therefore they are exceptionally uh, suspect in the eyes of the regime. And so one of the uh, conclusions, I think, for me would be, uh, in the case of Nabil Shorbaji, is that he was, uh, these three categories, you know, he was thrice doomed in these categories. Not only was he an activist in the 2011 uprising, but also second, he was from Dareya, and third, he was a journalist. So um, it, uh, in the eyes of the regime, he was, he was a triple triple enemy. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions to follow up in, in a measure of obviously ignorance, but I just wanted for purposes of measuring um, accountability in measuring the, the acquiescence of the state or actually the liability that the Syrian state carries in all of these civilian and journalist attacks. Could you, if, if it was part of your, of your study, describe the situation when it comes to this repression and persecution prior to 2011, and also what level of dissenting, if you know, uh, what's happening then and amongst lawyers, journalists? So a, a number of conditions that I described here, they existed before uh, 2011. Uh, so the, what happened uh, specifically in 2011 uh, is an intensification of existing forms of violence. So there was torture before 2011. There was hatred against some of these journalists and activists and lawyers before 2011. But 2011 is an important breaking point because of the scale of the demonstrations and the scale of the opposition, which also meant that the regime, the upscaled their own uh, violence against uh, against the, uh, these these categories, but the in principle this. So if I just go back one second, the um, this system in the beginning, this system has been fully in place in 2011. In fact, it was in in place in 2001, in 1991, in 1981. And in terms of the the ability or the potential plausibility of any legal actions or any habeas corpus, was it that something that, I mean, it is a pre-2011, it's a point of inflection where courts, tribunals, other kind of commissions functioning at any level in providing for the citizenship prior to 2011? So what we, often the case is that uh, uh, people who study Syria and among the experts, there is a distinction between the state and the regime. So the, the state are those, um, at, at least on paper, uh, moderately functioning institutions, such as uh, Ministry of Education, or such as a Department of Water Management, uh, or the, um, the system of public transportation. All of these, obviously, they exist, and including a... a uh, civil law and a criminal law uh, system existed before 2011. The difference was that while the state tries to function, the regime, and by that we mean this co system of coercive apparatus that, uh, that cast a shadow on the functioning of the state, that the regime was always there, and that the regime prevented the normal functioning uh, of the state. Uh, which means that uh, for example, 
if um, a, an intelligence officer committed a crime, for example, he caused a traffic accident, and in that traffic accident somebody died, uh, then the family of the victim could take the intelligence officer to court. And that normal court would then try to maybe pick up the case, if they had all dared. Uh, but very soon, the judges and the prosecutors, they would be visited by the, one of the intelligence bosses, or not even visited, they would make a phone call, uh, and that case was then off. It was uh, uh, shelved. And this is a good example of the type of undermining of the rule of law that the regime and its violent apparatus have. Its hold on the f normal functioning of the Syrian state is absolutely suffocating for uh, this country. And just to be clear, that will be prior to 2011. This is prior to 2011. Yeah. So a judge or a prosecutor could be having the same fate that a journalist or a lawyer or someone on that, if they were daring to, you know, to do their job. Uh, absolutely. There are examples of uh, uh, prosecutors or brave uh, lawyers who try to take up cases against the Assad family, for example, or against one member of the Assad family who was involved in organized crime. Uh, I can guarantee you those people didn't end up well. What is the situation, if you know, of um, this kind of agents of the state, judges, prosecutors, currently in 2022? Well, as far as far as we have studied this uh, uh, in our in our book uh, and in general, uh, the undermining of the rule of law, whatever was left an inkling of this rule of law since 2011, has been fundamentally undermined in 2022. So now, the situation of, for example, lawyers or judges is even worse than it was in 2011. Uh, so, the impunity, the complete uh, legal chaos. Uh, the um, not rule of law, but rule by law. And so you have a president that just issues laws, uh, and and thinks that uh, thinks that he can just uh, can make laws bypass the entire uh, uh, procedure of parliament and and whatnot. This has been much more uh, institutionalized now than than ever than ever before. So it is we're dealing with uh, a, a rule by law that is is arbitrary, uh, that is in the service of the regime and not the state, and certainly not the society, uh, and that actually the legal system has been hijacked uh, in favor of strengthening the regime. So any and all of the laws that were promulgated since 2011, take the famous Law 10, for example, or a number of laws on property, uh, they only served actually to strengthen the regime and to, uh, to buttress um, and to underline the power uh, that the regime has now in its, self, in its perceived victory. And one last question. And in your research, that I presume has been lengthy, did your sources came mostly from the victims, uh, from prisoners and people they had suffered, or did you actually had, if you can answer, uh, some sources within the state or even within the regime? The most important uh, source that we used for this uh, book were uh, survivors, former detainees, uh, because it is them that uh, I th we think the public should be listening to. It's also them, through the construction of their stories, you get a really good sense of how the regime functions, uh, because they have witnessed the perpetrators and they've witnessed the regime from inside. But we have also uh, conducted a number of interviews with people in the state uh, and even people who are in the regime. So, for example, we uh, interviewed a militia member who uh, was running a private prison in his village uh, in which he was uh, kidnapping people for ransom or and torturing them because they were uh, opposition. And he openly spoke to us about uh, his crimes. So the information comes from uh, from different angles, really. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. Perhaps the panel of judges will ask now. I'll just see if anybody offline uh, online uh, has a question first. But I'm sorry, I can't see the uh, judges online. Uh, can we have it on the screen? 
Okay. I have a question. Okay. okay go. I have a question. Yes, Gil, go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Professor. That was uh, brilliant, uh, but deeply sad uh, exposition of uh, both the state and, and the uh, regime and the interaction between them. Um, I, I must say, uh, I was very interested, both as a lawyer, but also as a, a researcher who's studying not only the attacks on journalists in the Philippines, but uh, attacks on the lawyers in the Philippines. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to say that I'd be very interested in contacting uh, anyone who um, has been monitoring the uh, attacks on lawyers in Syria. Uh, perhaps you could uh, get the message to me somehow. Thank you. Okay, Philip. Yeah, you go first. Yeah, no, that's right. Let Philip. I'm sorry, but <clears throat> my question is in Spanish, and I, I hope that we can help me to. Um, la pregunta es esa. ¿Usted diría que actualmente hay un sistema judicial? There is a um, judiciary system that works, like uh, procurators, lawyers, or judges. And if there is access to this system, and if it's of any worth, and if there is any possibility to execute uh, con conden condens. Uh, oh, if it's possible to pursue punishment. Yeah. Just for la pregunta. Uh, if I if I understood the question uh, well, this is about uh, condolences to the no. families. No, the I question is whether today, if you will say uh, um, you have an opinion, obviously, all through your research, that the judicial system and uh, is working at any level or in any capacity, and if they are functioning in the sense of providing, well, assessments and, and potential convictions. I mean, that they, you will say that they are uh, at any level working. The, the only way that um, the, certainly the civil legal system works in Syria is in the favor of the regime. So uh, to the extent that any case touches on the interests of anybody influential in the regime, the example of the traffic accident I gave, or say, give an, I'll give another example, um, somebody, a Syrian family was living in a neighborhood, there were clashes in this neighborhood, uh, there was um, fighting, so they fled. They fled to Turkey, and then they fled to Germany. Then the fighting in that neighborhood is over. They try to return from Germany to Syria, or from Turkey to Syria, and they see that their apartment was taken by a soldier from the Syrian uh, army, or uh, a militiaman, or somebody from the intelligence uh, agency. So if they then try to either directly appeal to the new owners, um, or they try to take the case to court, they will either never make it to uh, a sitting uh, in court, a day in court, or they will um, be threatened uh, to the extent that uh, they will never even consider uh, launching a court case. So th there, is, there is no, you can't put it in a stronger way, there is no functioning proper legal system in, in, in Syria. It is a system that serves the regime, uh, both in, in the civil wing of this judiciary, but also in terms of the military courts. No? So there are military courts and military judges. These are people who uh, who sent uh, people to their deaths, who sentenced them, sentenced them on the f flimsiest or the most political of accusations, uh, and thereby caused the uh, caused the deaths of uh, thousands in some cases, uh, many more. Uh, so these people, uh, um, these judges, they are really in many ways, uh, uh, executioners, really, of, uh, of the regime, rather than, uh, than judges. Okay, I think Eduardo was next. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and forgive my ignorance, but we heard and we read that in Syria there are some regions that are control regions, and people mention in that way control or not control regions, okay? 
Uh, I frankly do not understand how, are, how is the dynamic of this situation. What are the regions that are under Assad controls? What are the regions that are not under Assad control? What is the dynamic between this situation? Because for us that is very important because to adjudicate responsibility to a state, we need to know if the state has, you know, presence in those uh, in, those, in those areas and, and what kind of presence and, and if it is some kind of, you know, informal or formal deal. Could you? I mean, I'm, I'm not, don't know if this is part of your expertise, but you can clarify the dynamic in the territory today. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in 2011, the entire country was in the hands uh, of Assad. Then we had the demonstrations. The regime responded violently against the demonstrations. Some people around the demonstrations took up arms to defend themselves. That became a civil war, what's called a civil war. And then we had territorial uh, segmentation. Some parts were in the hands of the rebels, the Free Syrian Army, and other parts were in the hands of Assad. Uh, then within a number of years, two other uh, actors joined. One was ISIS, and the other, second one were the Kurdish PYD. Uh, at some point in 2015, the country was uh, divided into four. There was one part in the hands of Assad, one part in the hands of the Kurds, the PYD, uh, one part in the hands of the various rebels, and one part in the hands of ISIS. Uh, ISIS was defeated. Uh, the rebels have uh, have suffered quite a bit and have kind of uh, have been defeated in a number of ways. Um, and right now, the country is divided into three parts. Most of it is in the hands of Assad, including all the major cities, Aleppo, uh, Damascus, Homs, Hama, Latakia, Tartus, uh, Dara, Sueda, some major cities are in the hands, the bulk of the population is in the hands of the regime. Then we have a large part in the northeast of the country in the hands of the Kurds. And in the northwest of the country, there's uh, an, an area that is still under control of the rebels uh, or under the control of the, uh, of the Turkish army. And Assad only has control in his own territory. That's uh, that's an important point. If I may, have a very short, uh, sorry, a very short follow-up question. So, in those regions that you say is not under Assad control, the institutions of states are working. And following my colleague' question about the judiciary, if you are a citizen there and you have a problem with a neighbor, and you want to go to the courts. What courts are there? The courts of the state, the courts of the rebels, it's a new state, what, what's going on? In the areas controlled by the rebels, there are courts uh, by, that the rebels have set up. And in the entire rebel area, Assad has zero influence anymore. So uh, the, uh, the institutions of the Syrian state under Assad's control have no influence there, including the jud judiciary, education system, uh, public infrastructure, uh, I don't know, the, the road repair, for example, you name it, everything is in the hands really of the rebels and of their civilian um, um, wing. Uh, in the areas under control of the Kurdish, um, of the Kurdish groups, the PYD especially, um, they also have their own judiciary uh, and they have their own public infrastructure. The regime also has no control there, with one or two small exceptions uh, of an, uh, maybe an airport in the northeast of the country, and maybe one security uh, uh, branch in the northeast of the country. But in principle, Assad only controls the territories. The, the reach of his, his law, if you can call that, is only under his own control right now. You approximately remember the difference between rule of law and rule by law. I would like to know whether there is now martial law in Syria. First question. Second, have new criminal law, uh, laws been enacted from 2011? And where, in which book we, we, we can find information on criminal law in force today? And the last question. There have been prosecutors and judges persecuted by a regime? Mm -hmm. So the uh, mil military law 
uh, or the state of exception was uh, in uh, in force in Syria since the 19, late 1960s. And that was all the way up to and including uh, the year 2011. At some point it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, briefly abolished. Uh, but it didn't really mean anything because the practice uh, of the regime was still that the intelligence agencies not only were exceptionally eff effective, they were still very powerful and above the law, but also, um, um, since 2011, the power of the intelligence agencies has grown immensely uh, to the extent that whatever was uh, was even um, was in state in terms of the, the rule of law or any ab abolition of military law or state of exception was, has become entirely irrelevant. So whether there was military law or there was no military law might have had maybe details, maybe, maybe, might have had some uh, a number of small um, uh, uh, impacts in daily life, such as whether soldiers could walk in the streets with their uniform on or not. But this was irrelevant because the four-dimensional intelligence uh, the totalitarianism has has been there uh, since 1970. Nothing uh, really has changed there. Uh, there are a number of, I think, good books about or articles about uh, the, uh, uh, the the rule of law and uh, military rule in Syria. I, I'm happy to share that. Uh, of course, I'm happy to share the titles with the with the, with the court. And I have the last part of the question, Mr. Rossi allows me. It's are there crimi no criminal laws enacted uh, hmm. in Syria since 2011? Um, if no. you know, of course. No, definitely. Um, the um, so there have been a number of changes uh, to a number of law, criminal laws. None of these have been entirely have made a major change in the oppression system that I've seen that we've seen here. What they have made a change in, maybe at some point, was, for example, um, the uh, regulations uh, towards the army. Uh, so, for example, what, how long should a soldier remain at the front? What happens with a soldier if he steals from civilians? So a number of these uh, laws that were enacted were mostly to regulate the war against the rebels. But the violence against civilians against categories of civilians. That stayed in effect. And none of the laws that were promulgated before 2011 or after 2011 had any effect whatsoever on the violence against, uh, against civilians. And uh, if we uh, look at f a number of lawyers, for example, or prosecutors, then the number that has fled, fled from the country, not only fled as Syrians because, li because life was difficult or there was repression or there was war, but they fled specifically because they were uh, attacked and assaulted because they are uh, lawyers or decent prosecutors or decent judges, that number is very high. There are a number of, of uh, Syrian uh, diaspora groups uh, consisting solely of lawyers, for example. There's the Syrian Legal Network in the Netherlands. There is the Free Syrian Lawyers Association in Turkey. And so there are hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of people if anything, if if there if any normal functioning rule of law uh, exists, then these Syrians are outside of the country. Yeah, um, uh, Professor, I just wanted a clarification. This um, Ali Mamluk, who's head of the General Intelligence Directorate, right? Uh, so, in the in the uh, hierarchy of authority, would he be like number two to Assad? And therefore, would things like even the secret prisons and all, which I presume he would be aware of, would the direction for them be in consultation with the, the president? Or is it has he got that kind of autonomy given to him by Assad politically so that he can continue? I mean, what is the relationship if, if he is, in fact, number two? I don't even know whether he is, so I'm asking you that question. Mm -hmm. Just trying to understand the, the way it works, yeah. Uh, thank you. This is a very good and important question. Um, a little disclaimer is that the, the Assad regime is a closed box. It's a black box that does not allow research into its functioning, not like any other state. If I want to find out, for example, who is the head of the Dutch intelligence agency 
I can get on a train here and just go there, walk into their building, get from them a few brochures, maybe a cup of coffee, and they will send me away. But in Syria, that is, of course, not the case. Um, so whether to what extent he is the number two or he is the deputy of the uh, general intel intelligence directorate or he is not formally but informally the man behind Assad as we always see him in these photos these photos of these diplomatic encounters uh, or state state uh, uh, um, state uh, meetings they always show Assad in the front but what is interesting are actually the men behind him and when we look at him uh, from from the perspective of actual power that he wields so not the formal hierarchy in terms of what is the pyramid. Uh, then we do uh, see, and we see an overlord actually who has wielded this power since the 1970s. He was very close to Assad's father, Hafez Assad, and since 2011 was very important in the repressions. We know that, for example, because of a number of leaked uh, or smuggled documents from inside the intelligence. Um, so these were lower intelligence officers who took documents with them and then ran, ran off. And some of these documents, they bear their orders that, that bear his signature. He always signs with the, the letter M, which is the Arabic meme. Um, and um, one of these uh, orders that he has given, for example, to all of his intelligence, his underlings, is to leave uh, the militias that were established in 2011, to leave them alone to not arrest them, to give them impunity, uh, and to let them uh, do their work, in quotation mark. And these militias are the same militias that have set up these secret prisons. So, so in, he is not only uh, aware of the existence of these secret prisons, I mean, he manages the actual prisons, uh, or he manages the managers of the actual prisons. So not only is he aware of the secret prisons, but he also has given impunity, full impunity to the people um, um, managing uh, these these prisons and 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 uh, therefore also directly responsible for all of the crimes that are committed in these prisons. So the people who would go into the who would be arrested by the militias and taken to these secret prisons, the orders then would come from the top, right? It would not be something that the militia themselves would decide. But there would be a decision that this kind of person should be taken to a secret prison. I'm trying to understand how it works between all these four different mm -hmm. of, levels that you have. Of, of all the four levels, the secret prisons of the militias are the most autonomous, the most um, informal, the most arbitrary. So even, there ha they don't have to be official orders given for people to be arrested. So it's not that someone like Ali Memluk might only concern himself with some of the VIP individuals who are, let's say, foreigners, for example, or um, important Syrian politicians or activists. He wouldn't necessarily concern himself with an ordinary figure, some journalist in some, some city. But by, by providing impunity to the militia, uh, by um, um, allowing that impunity to continue after hearing reports that people are being kidnapped and ransomed and tortured and executed and killed and massacred in these secret prisons. And by allowing that to fester for years and not putting a stop to it, even though he has the power to, he's obviously, uh, you know, indirectly, if not directly responsible for these, for this violence. There don't have to be orders given for people to be arrested and tortured. Impunity is enough. And sometimes even less than a formal impunity, sometimes a wink is even enough. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I want to know if the regime has a specific way to punish journalists, if this gulag system that you show us has a specific or differential patterns to journalists, and if Nabil's case shows some of these possible modus operandi. Uh, so in, in, in principle, uh, whatever I know from Nabil's case is basically from whatever we know from the media, what people have published about him, so I don't have more information about the specific case. Uh, but we, we did interview a number, large number of journalists who were, or citizen journalists who were arrested and, uh, and killed. And the difference between journalist and citizen journalist is 
the journalists were kind of professional journalists who maybe did an education at the university in media and communication, who work for a media outlet, uh, who are professionally trained. And citizen journalists were basically anybody in 2011 that picked up a camera or a smartphone and started videotaping demonstrations or started videotaping the regime's violent response uh, to those uh, demonstrations. And the, uh, maybe the difference would be uh, that in some cases the regime works with lists. It has blacklists, basically, of, uh, of journalists, for example, that have to be arrested. Uh, this we will only find out if the regime ever falls and if we ever look into its archives. Uh, then we, we will know whether somebody gave an order. Uh, and some journalists were, of course, known and rather famous. They were uh, targeted specifically for that reason. And these were Syrian journalists, but they were also sometimes foreign journalists. So think of, uh, of Marie Colvin, for example. Uh, Marie Col Colvin, uh, from, from, uh, uh, who, who was killed in, uh, in the city of Homs. It was targeted specifically because she was a journalist. And the, on the other hand, these ordinary citizen journalists that the regime does not have on a blacklist, the method there would be that the uh, intelligence uh, or the uh, militias would roam the streets Anybody with a camera was automatically seen a suspect. If you have a camera, that was more dangerous than if you had a weapon, almost. Almost. Uh, and second, um, those people who, had, who didn't have a camera but had used smartphones, so the normal modern smartphones with cameras that we have since 2000, in 2011, uh, if you would go to YouTube in 2011 and you would type in Syria, then you would get thousands, hundreds of thousands of videos of v v regime violence against demonstrators. The people who videotaped that were the citizen journalists. The regime, the way that, that the regime dealt with them was by, um, on the one hand, killing people who were uh, v v uh, filming. We know that from a number of people who were uh, citizen journalists who, for example, went on a high place to a balcony and they were videotaping demonstration and they were sniped directly Many of them videotaped their own death. Uh, but also, uh, if you would go through these checkpoints, in 2011 the regime erected thousands of checkpoints across the country, then at the checkpoint the intelligence officer would want to see your phone. They would say, give me your phone, unlock your phone, and they would then flip through your phone to see whether you took, you took any footage or any photos or if you have any other anti-regime messages or any acts of journalism that were immediately would be cause for arrest and torture, if not worse. So these are the two different ways, working with blacklists or working with checkpoints. And the punishments were the same for the whole, all the people? In, in principle, I am inclined to say yes. Um, there are, um, there is a bit of ambivalence here. On the one hand, there are people who argue that if you were more Famous, for example, you would be a bit more privileged, and the regime would maybe you would maybe suffer less violence. On the other hand, people would say the exact opposite as well. Because you are famous, you are more influential, and therefore levels of violence would be higher. But in principle, the um, uh, the treatment would be uh, roughly the same. It would be arrest, beatings, taken in the car to the branch. In the branch, they would uh, beat you up. They would torture you. They would extract a kind of forced confession from you, maybe, if you have if you, you haven't died from torture yet, uh, and from there on you could be either transferred to uh, court or, or to the uh, to one of the three uh, one of the uh, prison camps, mostly Said Naya. I wanted to ask about um, <clears throat> you mentioned archives. And uh, I'm wondering, have there been any cases of, um, of documents uh, that have uh, found their way from the archives uh, outside? Uh, well, yes, there have, uh, in two ways. One is uh, people inside the regime have uh, leaked uh, documents, uh, either digitally, um, such as the famous Caesar photos on a USB stick and taken out of the country, uh, or physically, there are people who have taken paper, paper documents, like very incriminating documents, put them in an envelope, 
put them in their jacket or in their in their bags and then uh, run away from the country. Uh, and the second way is um, those areas where the regime lost territory, uh, the intelligence branches and the archives of the regime that stayed in these in, uh, lost territories or liberated territories, uh, they were uh, taken by uh, an, a number of NGOs uh, who are safekeeping, uh, safekeeping them for future uh, prosecutions. So, and, and these are a large number of, uh, of documents that also pertain to issues such as uh, uh, the hierarchy of the regime, uh, the violence of the intelligence branches, and a number of other uh, really relevant uh, issues. Can I ask the prosecutor, are we going to hear anything more about, um, about uh, documentation and uh, evidence of either internal documents or I think the previous witness spoke of um, thousands of pamphlets, grey matter, that uh, may, be, may be being maintained by um, uh, organisations, documentation organisations. Are we going to hear this from any other witness? We will have um, lawyers and journalists amongst the rest of the testimony. They will tell us about the work that they've been doing and information that they've been gathering, and yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, question, question. May I ask a question? Uh, Marina's just about to ask, and then back to you, Gil. Thanks. Uh, as a court, we are particularly interested in uh, establishing a pattern of impunity, and from what you said, uh, the term itself, impunity, is almost naive. I mean, you are describing a system in which there is no accountability at all. So I'm wondering if there is any, um, any, um, any hope or any procedure, any way we can imagine that some uh, accountability will be established uh, uh, Within the Syrian the the regime, we are talking clearly. We are talking about the territory, about the the the, the Syrian state. We are not talking here, uh, if I understood, about the territory held by other forces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are dealing now with the Syrian state. But I'm wondering if the term impunity here has some <laughs> some space. I, I, uh, so there are two ways of looking at impunity. One is that the regime at some point uh, has offered uh, de jure impunity uh, to, uh, to the intelligence uh, branches by um, issuing, I have to look at the, uh, the details of the, of, the, of, the, of the law, by uh, offering uh, so de jure impunity to intelligence uh, agents who, if they uh, commit a, an infraction, for example, or if they kill anyone, then they cannot be held responsible for their acts. So this is a kind of official de jure uh, impunity meted out by the regime to the intelligence uh, agents. Intelligence agents, they know this, so um, that means that if they do drive with 300 kilometers through uh, Damascus and they kill someone, they know that that person, that victim, will never come back to them and, and haunt them. But there's also de facto impunity. De facto impunity is the negligence that the regime has. The ne regime neglects to follow up on cases of, um, of injustices by the intelligence in, uh, in, uh, agents or by its militias. Uh, and this continued uh, n negligent impunity has the effect that every Syrian knows that you should you should never mess with the intelligence branches or with somebody from the army or etc., because you cannot in any way get um, pursue your rights, not in the court. And the only way you could maybe do that in some way is if you uh, develop some form of patronage with someone in the regime who's high enough to make a phone call that 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 intelligence agent that ran somebody over at the traffic light will be uh, will be punished. But even that is not a legal punishment. That's not a rule of law punishment. That is an arbitrary, uh, personalized punishment by somebody who thinks you did wrong. But um, the I am absolutely 
um, entirely negative about any form of uh, uh, accountability in, in areas where the regime has control uh, because there are no examples of it, not since 2011 and really not before. I think most Syrians would find that, uh, well, entirely laughable to, to, uh, to think that the regime can be prodded or can be uh, stimulated to pursue any form of accountability. Um, and in fact, we have the exact opposite of accountability, so not just impunity, but we have the opposite of accountability, which means that those people who have committed the worst crimes for the regime are actually promoted and are in, in increasingly installed in increasingly po more powerful positions since 2011. If we look, for example, at the, let's say, the worst killers since 2011 in the middle management branch, they are now all heads of the intelligence uh, branches. So we have the exact opposite of accountability. Not even impunity, but like anti-accountability, if you will. I think we have two questions from judges who are online, uh, Gil and Maria Rosaria, both. So, uh, Gil, you have your hand up. Yeah. Two questions. One, uh, probably f quite simple. Uh, I don't think we've discussed the ordinary police. I assume there still are some um, and their functions. The second one is, um, as I understand the statistics, something like 20 to 25% of the journalists killed have been killed in the non-Assad areas. Um, and so uh, I would actually like to know something about uh, accountability and impunity in those areas. Thank you. Um, the the police are, um, if I may be blunt and uh, transparent about it, in Syria are a uh, a Boy Scout club that really has absolutely zero power in uh, in this country. In that, um, their salaries are insufficient. Um, they their um, um, their powers, their the the reach of their influence is exceptionally weak. They concern themselves with mostly with uh, um, taking uh, traffic bribes from people or adjudicating tiny little conflicts between maybe neighbors. But the the whole issue, of course, is of the regime is that the the police and the army, which has many countries have a police and an army. The Netherlands also has a police and an army. This is the monopoly of violence in this country. Um, and but the problem is that the police and the army in Syria are overshadowed by the intelligence branches and by the militias. So um, that means they are only kind of secondary, entirely secondary, entirely fiddling in the margins, um, irrelevant, uh, no influence whatsoever. Um, and there are a large number of examples really of uh, situations in which a police officer, for example, would be um, threatened by a, a, an intelligence officer or would um, be marginalized entirely by the uh, someone in the militias or even in the army. So the police is uh, uh, no. Uh, I, I don't think it has any any serious influence. Um, and we've also seen that even in the repression of the uprising in 2011. So it was mostly the intelligence and the militias that did that uh, repression. And, and it's not the police because even the regime doesn't trust its own police force. To do that. Uh, second, about the statistics, um, I'm not aware, I, I don't know the precise st statistics, but it does make some sense that the overwhelming majority of uh, journalists were killed under and by the Assad regime, and, and that a number of them, you know, not, not a negligible number, uh, but still a minority, uh, have been uh, arrested, kidnapped, disappeared, killed, tortured by. Uh, Primarily by ISIS, uh, well, ISIS operated basically like these, like the Assad intelligence uh, uh, forces, uh, in that it was against any form of transparency. It was ag against any form of free media. Uh, it only allowed its own propaganda machines to operate, uh, and the boys and girls that really had kind of heroically tried to document anything uh, or tried to keep any form of information coming 
uh, or uh, secretly taping what was going on under ISIS territory. A large number of them, of course, were found out and were killed uh, or tortured or disappeared. Uh, also in the areas controlled by the Kurds or by the rebels, there are infractions against journalists, definitely, but they pale in comparison with uh, the violence of the regime uh, and even with that uh, of ISIS. Marie or Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor, for um, your very important and interesting testimony. I, I have the more or less the same question uh, Marina asked. Um, I would like to have more information about the legal status of impunity and immunity of uh, uh, military and security officers. So, so um, the, the, I mean, this is, uh, as, I, as I said, the, uh, there is a uh, com uh, formal legal uh, de jure uh, impunity handed out to, uh, to intelligence officers. Um, that was promulgated some time in the beginning when the regime really began in the 1970s. I'm not mistaken, and that continued all the way up to and including the, the 2011 demonstrations uh, and beyond. But what is much more important, I think, is the de facto impunity and immunity that the intelligence branches uh, enjoy. So even uh, in a hypothetical case, purely hypothetical, um, even if there was a law that prohibited um, um, outrages or violence by intelligence uh, officers, um, the, as, as we saw, the, the system, the regime has developed such an incredible elaborate system of intelligence that it's, it's not very credible to believe that, uh, that everybody would hold, its, um, hold themselves to, this, uh, to these laws. And so the, the de facto uh, the actually experienced impunity and immunity uh, is much more important than whatever laws the the regime promulgates. I mean, the regime promulgates laws and it doesn't carry them out. So, uh, or it does not promulgate laws and it carries something out. So there, there's also a level of arbitrariness here. Uh, but the only way really to establish the the power, the impunity, and the immunity of the regime and its intelligence branches is by listening to ordinary Syrians' daily lived experiences with the, uh, with the intelligence branches. That's the only way to understand how this regime works, by asking ordinary people and by collating that material uh, to paint a collective picture of uh, the, uh, the intelligence violence. Thank you very much. Thank you, I think we'll Thank you. I'm just going to, just one last question. I realize it's not your cup of tea and we've been uh, insisting on this, but it's in the explicit sense of things then, to your knowledge, any amnesty laws or amnesty provisions that have been included in the legal body in Syria in recent years in particular? Mm -hmm. So an, an, an amnesty is something that um, the regime and especially, well, the president, obviously, himself, who they promulgate every once in a while. And these amnesties, they, on the one hand, they concern uh, categories of, of then what the regime calls crimes. For example, an amnesty for terrorism, in quotation mark. But the quotation mark terrorism uh, that the regime defines is basically any form of resistance or opposition to the regime. So picking up a camera and holding it, videotaping a demonstration is seen as terrorism. So that's that's one thing against certain categories. There have been amnesties. On the other hand, there are amnesties against particular populations. For example, rebel fighters that fought the regime. At some point, a number of them received an amnesty. Uh, and then third, there are some amnesties for uh, regime personnel. Uh, who might have committed infractions or who basically k killed the wrong people. Uh, so, for example, they committed violence against loyalists, 
regime loyalists, then were thrown in prison. Some of these people also received amnesties. But there are two things to say about these amnesties. One is that they are entirely arbitrary, and they are promulgated either during some of the Islamic holidays, like, what is it, 10 days ago, uh, or at the whim of the uh, president, or to deflect attention from a kind of international scandal, such as the Tadamon massacre, that um, f that f f you know that preceded uh, this uh, amnesty, recent amnesty, and the second thing is this is very important as well. Sometimes the regime releases people without an amnesty, and sometimes there's an amnesty and it doesn't release people, and there are a number of people in prison who actually officially should be benefiting from these amnesties. And they tell that to their jailers, but they're still not left out, of, and they're still in Sidnaya. So amnesty also, arbitrary, haphazard, and um, uh, entirely at the whim of the presidency. Thank you so much. No, we don't have any more questions. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you.